Great Britain is and always has been one of the great marts of the world. And to its ports come ships laden with the produce of every continent. On faraway South American plains roam great herds destined to become part of the larder which she cannot completely fill herself. Trade is born of one nation's need and another's surplus. Born of a need for certain vital commodities. Meat is only one of them. What has Great Britain to offer in return? That one simple question is the basis of all trade between one country and another. What can you offer in return? The men of the meat ships, driven halfway round the world, should know. The men of the docks should know. And so should the railwaymen, with their lines of transport to maintain. So too should the men of the coal storage. Perhaps the answer is in some quiet valley, where eventually some of the meat is bound to find its way. Follow just one joint. Food for a family that might be found anywhere in the world. A man and his wife and their children. Do they know? The man should. For six generations, his fathers have followed his trade. A grim trade that has brought them very little else but sweat and toil. Sweat and toil relieved by one great gift, the gift of song. For their harmony is known throughout the world. As David Evans carves the joint, does he think that in return for that meat, he and three quarters of a million others in his industry provide one of the articles Great Britain offers in exchange? Not only for export, but to drive the ship, the train, the refrigerator, and even to cook his midday meal. Does he know? It may be that he lives too near his work to see it in its true perspective. Huge shafts, the sentinels of these valleys are almost the trademarks of his craft. They provide him with much needed air while he works. But before he can descend, he must enter the bathhouse. His bathhouse, for he and his mates have helped to pay for it out of their earnings. Here he strips, and placing his street clothes in a numbered locker, crosses from one side of the building to the other, getting from a second locker, bearing the same number, the oldest and grimiest of working clothes. Then, off to fetch the lamps he will need underground. One for his safety, one for his work. When he first started work here, 19 years ago, he received these same lamps. They are his throughout his working life. They are cleaned and tended in his absence, for much depends on them, Sometimes, everything. With his lamps and his food can, he joins his mates on the relief shift, waiting his turn for the 750-yard drop into the bowels of the earth. It takes just 55 seconds. Just 55 seconds, but the journey down is not all. Often a walk of two or three miles awaits them. They tramp stolidly through a strange world of half light, of odd disused corridors branching off in every direction, 
of rumbling trams always going round and round the whole workings, always being filled and shot to the surface, there to start a journey that may end, well, anywhere in the wide world where coal is needed. And that means nearly every part of both hemispheres. In this underground city of pit props and darkness is being hewn, or won, the centuries-old petrified forests that have become coal. Coal vital to man and his industry. So vital that every year 200 million tons of it are hewn and blasted, picked and shoveled. 200 million tons of it, more than 50 million of which are for export. So day and night, year in, year out, tub follows tub, travelling swiftly to the surface. The coal, when starting its strange journey, seems to spend most of its time being weighed. First, as it comes up. Then, after running into tippers, at the bottom of which screens separate large from small, the large lumps are weighed again. At every weighing stand two men. One for the miner, one for the owner, for the man is paid by the weight he has won. The smaller coal drops through onto a conveyor belt, is weighed again for the third time, and then whisked away to be washed. In the washery, it is mixed with water, fed with air, and kept constantly undulating. The whole is a fantasia of black rhythm. The slag drops, the coal passes on. We go through the same process again and again until at last it reaches a sieve that turns and turns without ceasing, apparently without human interference. Gradually, the giant mill sorts out the coal into four sizes whose names sound more as if they came from a garden than from a mine. Cobbles, nuts, beans, and peas. Meanwhile, the bigger lumps have fallen onto a travelling belt and undergone a process known as screening. Men spend their lives in this grime-laden atmosphere, experts at their job. Coal dust is a leveller that covers manager, foreman and man with equal impartiality. Here, slag, the useless stone, inevitable to any seam, is detected and removed by hand, broken up and sent to some distant dump. The instinct of these pickers is uncanny. To an ordinary eye, one lump looks much the same as another, black and heavy. There seems no difference, yet when passed by these men, the coal assumes a status accepted throughout the world. This black wealth, which millions of years ago was a tropical forest, will perhaps go to the tropics, perhaps to the blazing sunshine of South America. And meanwhile, down below, the shift has ended, and as night begins to sink into the valley, the men return. David's work is done for the day. Below, others have taken his place, and the work goes on all through the night.
through the night. All through this coal, the finest in the world, has traveled down to the sea, down to the ships, to sail to every land whose commodities Great Britain needs in exchange, outward bound, to complete the full cycle of trade and commerce on which depends the prosperity of all the people of the world.